Harley and Marley. You're both present. Read them. I'm going to mark the opposite. I didn't think you'd mind. Okay. And let's hear. But she was impressed by my shop. Okay. Beautiful. You come in, you have to have your laptop, and you will log on, everything else off your desk. You have your laptop, you have your hands. That's it. And we will get started. Hopefully everything won't crash. Never know. And the test, I'm looking between 20 and 25 multiple choice. I'm still tinkering around with it. And four or five short IDs. Remember short ID or short essays? Have to explain first couple sentences what it is, where, when, then next part, give an example, and then why it's important, what it led to, something specific, not, and then prosperity and happiness. No. Declaration of Independence. What I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, divide it up in the short ideas, and so I'll give you like three or four choices and ID two of them. And then those three or four choices I need to. So I'll give you the choices. And then you pick two or so or whatever. And then of the Declaration of Independence, I will ask very specifically on um, there are three main parts of the philosophy. So I ask you to identify. You have to show every one or two of those. Okay. So the, remember that's equality, unalienable rights, yeah. or social contract. Yeah. So are we just taking the test like up to the deck? Declaration of Independence, or are we doing it up to where we learned already? Where we've stopped it, we're, we're going to get to the Treaty of Paris here as soon as we're done, and that'll be where it works. Okay. The Treaty of Paris. And then there's like one question, there's one multiple choice on the Treaty of Paris. It should be pretty easy because we decided today. Yeah? Is the significance of David Rebellion the Yeah, the big thing is. Um, to the, make sure the classes were divided into the slave codes, and that would lead to racism in the idea of this. Mm -hmm. And then somebody came on. I wonder if I'm broadcast. Ah. Okay. Some reason the test isn't working, but I assume now it's broadcasting. And so this will go up to the Treaty of Paris. Remember, Bacon's Rebellion or racism, I'll for sure ask you on that one. Maybe I'll ask you about like a choice between Bacon's Rebellion or racism, and they're very much tied together. But you will have to answer that one for sure. I'm just making sure that we're broadcasting. It appears to be broadcasting, but still excellent condition. And somebody put down they like it. <laughs> I think that's kind of funny. Any other questions? Anything on there you're not sure about? So there'll be, you know, salutary neglect be a question. Mercantilism. There'll be a question. You know, remember mercantilism, that's a trade and navigation act. And then they tried to enforce mercantilism after the French and Indian, Indian War. There'll be two treaties of Paris, 1763 and 1783. Battle, Second Continental Congress. You want to just take it now? Yes, sir. Uh, are we going to need to know like, a lot of dates or just like the Declaration of Independence or probably the American? Yeah, there might be a like, 70, like, proclamation in 1763. Uh, you know, if you're going to mention you know, Bacon for Value, it's good to know uh, at least a year. And remember what I said about the short IDs it's what, where, when. So at least a good idea of the debate, or the, the debate, the date. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I already forgot. Anything else? It's going to be a fun test. I'm not quite done, but I got a hundred. I nailed it. 
I'm telling you what, you write your own tests, it's so like, yes. So on everything but like the QA, so like the multiple choice, is that like a general overview of things? Or yeah, very, it, it should be relatively basic, but of course your basic might be different than my basic, but I try to make it Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I always say that and I think, well, gosh, the, uh, it's a little. But I, some are going to be like really basic, some you have to read through the, read through the choices pretty carefully. Yeah, thumbs up, two thumbs up. Oh, yeah. Any other questions off that list? So you feel pretty good about it? So 20 to 25 multiple choice, four or five short IDs. I'm really concerned about the time. You know, we have a little bit shortened periods, so I'm not sure how, how long this will take. And since for this you have to type, some people type a lot faster, some a little bit slower. No questions? So everybody online, you have to check in the beginning of your class period. And so 10.25 or so with your cameras on. So the next test, I'll probably make sure that it will be a B day so then you guys will check in. Then we'll have you on the big screen and we'll watch you take the test. Sound good? Yeah, I'm, just, I'm kind of winging it. And you know, who knows? Uh, one thing I will say, and I'm gonna say, I keep saying this, but um, if we have to go fully online, we will adapt and just keep going. And then we'll have to go by classes. I hope not, but it would not surprise me because it's blowing up. And, uh, oh, don't forget the schedule's up there, but that's not why I have that up there. I don't know why that's up there. So let's go ahead then and finish up the Revolutionary War. And... Okay, so this is about where we quit, wasn't it? Do you remember this from, oh, we're not gonna do a quiz today because I always want to review. We do have a big test tomorrow. I should add that I weigh the test a lot. You know, it's, uh, your, your tests are about 75 to 80% of your semester grade. I do give other assignments, and yeah, they'll help on the margins, but the tests are the biggie, and I do weigh those short IDs more. I know it slips. Any, okay, this is about where we put it, the Battle of Chesapeake Cape. What was the battle? And I know it's hard to say, I drew my wonderful map, but you can hardly see it. <laughs> That's the way life is. And where Cornwallis was chasing after, who was the commander of the South? The colonial commander had become a hero, yeah. Nathaniel Green. Yeah, the fighting Quaker, Nathaniel Green. Where he had, the, at the what's the battle where Cornwallis had to attack because he thought Green would escape? He put his militia in the front line and they ran, fired two shots and ran. There was a melee. The British won the battlefield, but, control, uh, but basically lost, strategically lost. What battle is that? Yeah. I don't know what battle is that. It's that fly, yeah. Oh. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the fly. I, this is my favorite fly. One of my favorite flies. You know, they didn't know what colors it was, so red, white, and blue. I did put the picture up on the screen, but I was pointing at something and all you could see was the screen. And I mentioned this in class on Friday. The US flag, it's, it's a good flag. I like Union Jack, a lot of good flags, but you gotta admit the Welsh flag is the best. With the dragon. You gotta admit, that is a great flag. So, Cornwallis escaped into, escaped. Went into Virginia, fought in that Revol uh, war, and then eventually fled to Yorktown, basically had the Royal Navy pull him out. It might have been over right there. Politically, the Whigs were gaining power, and it's like, why are we fighting this for? And they had to have the Royal Navy come. That's why I mentioned, I, did we get to the French? They had to ask the French. Did, you, did we get to the ships of the line? Yeah. So we got the ships of the line, is that where we quit? Did we mention what season it was? Here is the deal right now. So it's September, October, 1781. What season is it in the Caribbean? Hurricane. In fact, there's a hurricane right now at this month. Well, it's a tropical storm right here. 
But since it's so much warmer, it's going to collect, pick up steam, and it will become a hurricane in the next three or four days. Another hurricane is going to hit the United States. It's the new normal right now. But it's hurricane season in the Caribbean. How did somebody know a hurricane was coming in 1781? 100 mile per hour winds. That's all you do. This is hurricane season. If a, one of these sailing vessels is caught in a hurricane, they're destroyed. An entire French fleet was decimated in 1759. Absolutely destroyed. 100 ships because it, it got caught in a hurricane. There are British ships in the Caribbean, 19 ships of the line, another 100 ships, and those French ships of the line. And the French had just reinforced it. The French had over 100 ships then. Both admirals there had to make the decision, are we going to risk it? Are we going to risk hurricane season and sail up to the Chesapeake Capes right here? The British to pull their soldiers out of Yorktown, the French to blockade it. Who would risk it? Well, the British in Jamaica decided it was too risky. If they, their ships got caught there in, in the Caribbean in a hurricane, they might lose not only Yorktown, but Jamaica. Ironically, the French felt they had significantly less to lose. And so Admiral de Grasse risked it, made the risk, and that's why hurricane season and those three little islands that the French kept after the Treaty of Paris of 1763 would be decisive. At the end of September, or middle of September, when the French ships arrived here, the 12 ships of the line and their auxiliary ships arrived for the British here, saw the French fleet, saw they're outnumbered, retreated, and the blockade went into effect. That would be decisive. Hurricanes, French fleet, and now Washington, marching this way, can turn, can surround and turn the tide. So, at first, Washington's forces tried to take Yorktown but they tried to take it by storm, it failed, and so they laid siege. Surrounded the British troops, and these are the fortified lines at Yorktown, that a few redoubts, which are little forts out in front, but now they can't get out from the Royal Navy. Cornwallis's troops are done. They do not have enough supplies to hold out. I wanna make sure this is still recording. It appears to be. So. Going in October, they kept shelling Yorktown. <laughs> the American artillery, they didn't have enough gunpowder to practice, so they couldn't hit anything. The French were much better, once again, just like their uniforms, embarrassed them. But Washington ordered the taking of a couple forts right here. And when this fort fell, that's when Cornwallis realized it's done. By the way, that's redoubt number nine, just the ninth fort fortification. And one of the men leading the assault would be Washington's adjutant, a guy by the name of Alexander Hamilton. And Hamilton would become a war hero. And in many ways, kind of, a, not, I said kind of, in many ways, a scoundrel. But would become quite famous now because there's a play. And <laughs> that'd be very famous. Little to do about his life. That's real about his life. We'll get back to that. But once that happened, Cornwallis felt he had no choice, and October 19th, Cornwallis would surrender. And this was quite humiliating for Cornwallis. To surrender to a bunch of colonials, as they saw basically like hicks and yokels, to surrender to them. So this is a very stylized picture of Washington and his aide accepting the surrender. But what happened was this. Cornwallis refused to go to the surrender ceremony. Refused. I'm not going to go. I won't do it. He sent his second in command. And his second in command tried to surrender to the French general Rochambeau. Rochambeau, kind of smirky but also mad, he pointed to Washington. Washington, furious, would not accept the surrender from, a, from the second in command. And the surrender, you give your sword. So Washington pointed to his second in command. Benjamin Lincoln, right here. 
And yes, they probably weren't wearing wigs, but in this watercolor, they have really noticeable white wigs. They kind of look like the same person, don't they? So a little bit of gainsmanship there. Benjamin Lincoln accepted the surrender. And then the British forces stacked their arms, and they were allowed to board ships and leave. A huge victory. And while the British were stacking arms, getting ready to leave, they would play a waltz called The World Turned Upside Down. So here they are stacking arms. Here is sheet music for the waltz. A waltz was a style of music that was seen as really risque, kind of wild music. Kind of for young people you could dance to. It's pretty crazy music. And some of you, it might be a little bit over the top for you, but I'll play a little bit. This is a band at Yorktown at the reenactment playing it. Yeah, it's pretty crazy, isn't it? It's so funny, this was seen as like wild, outrageous music. I guess every generation has this. Look at that guy, crazy. Okay. And, quit playing. Part of the thing is, this really, I, I'm talking about the world turned upside down. That this was a big change for the world. This was not just a rebellion where somebody took power and then made himself king. This was a revolution that would, in many ways, change the way people all over the world felt about their relationship with governments. They had talked about in the enlightenment of people like John Locke. Well, these 13 colonies did. And that term revolution that we give now would come out of this. This is the French Revolution. Our idea of what a revolution was, of changing a government, was not heard of then. It's kind of like we mentioned how Bacon's Rebellion and after that, the concept of race would have done, we'd be developed. The United States is going to have a lot of influence, both good and bad, around the world. And this is one of them. Well, the peace treaty is going to be negotiated, and it's going to be in Paris. They're still fighting along the frontier. Remember, George Rogers clock is here. But the only British forces left in the, their former colonies are in New York. The Continental Congress is in Philadelphia. And even though they have very little power, we have two armies now faced up. Washington's smaller army here. Sorry, my mask is popping all over. And the British right there. And the French have kind of withdrawn support. After Yorktown, when the fighting kind of died down, the French are like, well, we don't care what happens in the Americas. So Washington has to keep his army together. If Washington can't keep his army together, this whole thing can still collapse. There's still two years to go until there's a treaty negotiation. If Washington's army falls apart, the British can and probably would have still won. And so we're coming to what's called the Newburgh Conspiracy. Newburgh, Connecticut. At the end of 1782, the Continental Congress has no money. Soldiers haven't been paid. Officers have, haven't been paid. They're being offered bonds, which are where governments borrow money, or land, but they don't think they might ever get any money from it. They're furious. What was this all for? But I mentioned Washington must keep his army together. The Continental Congress has been promising time after time, you're going to get paid. You're going to get paid. Robert Morris, who is this financier and kind of a, your definition of a very duplicitous money broker, he was very greedy. He, head of the finance, he had loaned money to the government, to the Continental Congress, and he wanted to make sure he got the money back. And the only way to get the money back, he thought, we need to make sure there's a strong government. And he and some other friends began to talk to officers in Washington's camp, including Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton was most certainly involved in this. I mean, Hamilton wanted a dictatorship without a doubt. But officers want Washington. They try to go to Washington, initiated by Robert Morris. Make yourself dictator. Right into Philadelphia, make yourself the supreme leader in total charge. That's what Washington wanted. Or that's what these officers want. Washington, who heard about this and had no idea which officers were involved and which weren't involved. By the way, that's Morris right here. A little bit heavy. The idea was he's wealthy, could afford a good diet. But Washington knew that if the British found out about this attempted mutiny 
and a coup or attempt to overthrow the government in Philadelphia, and it's over right there. So Washington gathered the officers in a meeting hall in Newburgh, Connecticut, and basically saying, please don't revolt. Please don't, because it's over. It's one of these moments that it really could have ended right here. Another one, another thing that uh, would have just been a footnote in history. So Washington's going to give a speech. Actually, it's more of a talk. It's a cold meeting hall. They're all packed together in essentially pews because it's a meeting hall slash church. And they're all packed in together. And Washington starts to read a letter from the con. He had a speech laid out, but in the speech was going to be a letter um, written from the Continental Congress, once again promising money. They sent this time after time, and he was actually thinking, this won't work. He might have had another plan in mind. And he came in, and the officers were mad, grumbling, not listening. And Washington started talking. And he pulled out the speech, and he starts reading off it, and says maybe a two or three lines, and then quit looked at the men, and they weren't listening. You, you could just tell, angry. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a pair of reading glasses. Just magnifying glasses, you know, they had those by then. These had bifocals. But he put on the reading glasses and read a couple words and looked up and, so just imagine this grumbling, 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 then silence once he pulled those glasses out. And then I was just looking at him, stunned. And Washington, who had gone through the campaign and aged noticeably. He was not healthy. He would not be healthy for the rest, healthy for the rest of his life. He lived for another, uh, get my years right, 17, 16 years, but um, he was not, you know, after years of campaigning, living in tents, all the pressure, noticeably aged. And he looked at the men and said, man, this has been a long war. And we've all had to make sacrifices. All of us have had to make sacrifices. He just looked at it for a sec, and then went back to start reading and put his head down. And all those furious officers were crying. Just crying. Overwhelmed. If Washington, who had led us, has made sacrifices, can't we make one more sacrifice? And that moment, he didn't even finish the speech. The speech is here if you go to Mount Vernon. The speech is there. Please go to the speech. There's the speech. And here is an officer coming up to him and, and just apologizing into the meeting. A brilliant bit of play acting. Now, he knew what he was doing. It worked. He didn't have anything to offer. All he could offer was an emotional response, and it worked. The Newburgh conspiracy ended, and Washington kept the army together to the end of the war. And add one more thing. I did not put this on the slide, but add one more thing. And then when the war ended, and the British finally left New York in 1784, Washington went home. Which was just unbelievable. He went home. He didn't ride in and take power. Washington, flawed, good and bad things. Still an amazing bit. He went on partially because he was just done. But with that, back to Paris. John Adams and Ben Franklin were the two lead negotiators. Good choices, you would think. Here's a painting that was done in Paris, and you notice it wasn't finished. They went home before they got done. So we have this still. That's a pretty cool painting. So see the canvas behind. Uh, uh, Franklin and Adams. And it made sense. They both written the they partially wrote the Declaration of Independence together, and the assumption was two of the best known people from the United, the new United States, perfect choices. As it turned out, they did not get along at all. Adams thought Franklin was a moral degenerate, and Franklin thought Adams was insane. Adams was all over the place. Could be enthusiastic and happy and overjoyed and then be in the darkest depression and deep anger. Up and down, up and down. Chaotic, really hard to talk to, really emotional. I guess you could say kind of like you might have like bipolar or something. You just didn't know that then. 
Evans was all over the place. He'd be furious, pout, then pouting, and, and then happy, then wanting to, to uh, or just dark depression and wanting to hide. We'll come back to this when Adams would be president. He'd be the exact same thing. So Franklin's like, I can't trust this guy. Well, Franklin was one of the most popular people in the world. And Parisian society were desperate to be around him. And he literally had a harem of young noble women who would follow him around to wherever he went. So here's Franklin in his 70s being followed around by all these 20-year-old women and probably having innumerable affairs with them. And Adams thought that was just repulsive and disgusting. That, along with Franklin, for whatever reason, liked to walk around the streets of Paris naked. With the image of then all these, it, we won't go there. But the whole thing was just, it's just an interesting, I guess you never thought about Ben Franklin walking around naked, and please don't think about it again. But France, still, they were negotiating in Paris. France and Spain could have cared less about the Americans. And so it ended up, they kind of negotiated in secret and quick got the treaty done before the rest of the treaty was even finished, and that's why this painting wasn't finished. And these are the main elements of the treaty. The US will be independent. Next, all area east of the Mississippi River, except for between Florida and Canada, now part of a huge United States. Remember George Rogers Clark. And therefore, all this area in green, there's still some areas that are disputed. A massive new country. Still divided. Most of the colonial now citizens of the U.S. live here, and there's those Appalachian Mountains in the way. Next, the loyalists were promised that they would be protected and compensated. So loyalists that remained would not be attacked anymore, and loyalists who fled could keep their land or get compensated for their land. Now there's some more things like fishing rights and rights to the Great Lakes, but the one we really have to get is this, access to the sea. The Mississippi River must be open because even though they got land to the Mississippi River, Spain still had New Orleans right here. There's no way the United States could keep this land if they didn't have access to the sea. The Appalachian Mountains was a barrier they couldn't get over with any supplies or goods. I should have. Anybody think this happened? Okay. Descendants of loyalists to this day still sue the United States. To this day. Think this happened? Maybe some war issues, and then the U.S. try to buy that land and get all Louisiana. That's another story. That's the treaty. The United States. Um, they quick scrambled out of there before the British could change their mind, got back to Philadelphia, and the war ended. The British would leave in 1784. They didn't quite totally leave, and that's another story. But that's where the unit ends. Right there. So the test will go up to the Treaty of Paris in 1783. And so the test will go from there, but I'm going to continue. We'll start the next unit. And I know we got to go. That is, a, I like that painting a lot. That's such a bad cop. I was going to make it bigger, and I started spreading out, and it got so pixelated. Want to hear the world turn upside down one more time? <laughs> yeah. All right. So, new unit. New unit. It's still recording. Xerxes, the founding of the Republic, the Articles of, and the first part is the Articles through the Constitution. Basically, this new government's going to be created and then be a disaster, and the, ne new, the next government, which is our current government. But this whole unit's the founding of the Republic. And so the next test will be starting right here. Put arrows, asterisks, whatever you want to do. Here's Washington at the, co the uh, Constitutional convention. They make the room look much bigger than what it actually is. So very quickly, the post-war United States. Got it? Republicanism. Everybody 
every state believed in a representative form of government. They did not want some king, some hereditary monarch to decide their fate. We are going to be a republic. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody had a vote to decide who would be the leaders. It's much more complex. Every state had different rules on who's eligible to pick their representatives. Nobody had universal suffrage. Men, some states allowed for men and women to vote. It was very complex. In fact, women would have um, more rights and then lose them. There's not like this, like a constant, like up of rights. It doesn't happen that way. It's a wave for everybody. This is a newspaper heading from a Philadelphia newspaper in 1784. Everybody feared a strong central government. Therefore, more power would go to the states. They didn't want a tyranny as they saw Britain and their tyrannical rule was because they had a central government. And so if the 13 colonies had a little more power, I'm sorry, not 13 states, I'm sorry. Next, all of them had, or most of them had, some idea of a bill of rights, these enlightened ideals of rights. But all the rights, sure, they might have been part of the Enlightenment, but they were from real world issues that, ha that happened in the years before the Revolution. But there was also a horrific economic depression. And we'll get back to this, because this is going to directly lead to the Constitution. So this economic depression. Uh, there are all kinds of currency. By the way, $4 reward, I cut that. That's for a runaway swing. So the first form of government for the new United States, the Articles of Confederation. Sometimes you see this called the Article. Sometimes you see this called the Confederation or the Confederacy. That is the first government. They actually came up with this as a wartime measure in 1777, but it would not be formalized. They couldn't find, get all the states to agree to 1781. But it didn't matter until the British left. So think about it, 1783, 1784. And this was a wartime measure. This was done as something we could pass during the war by this Confederation Congress that was all, um, it was a pretty loose affiliation. And by definition, though, it is weak. They did not want a strong central government. That should tell you then that the Constitution was meant to be a very strong central government. Very strong. But that's coming. So, weak central government. And how they did it was the way they set the system up. But don't forget, this was a wartime measure. And there's problems with things done during a war. Because this was created to help win the war. Maybe not to govern after the war. We will see this with Reconstruction after the Civil War. But Congress, there would be a Confederation Congress. In fact, that would be the whole government, a Congress. And each state would have one vote. Every state could send as many representatives as they wanted. Philadelphia sometimes was just overwhelmed with representatives. But Philadelphia still only had one vote. Rhode Island still had one vote. Did this favor, or what kind of states did this favor? If every state had one vote, what kind of states were favored? Yeah. Yeah. You sure? Yeah. Yeah. It would really favor the less populated states because the less populated states would have their their voters or. Um, the less populated states, there'd be more representative per voter. They really favor the less populated. By the way, in the United States government today, in Congress, which body favors small states now? Yeah. The Senate, but the Senate is meant to represent the states as entities. So all states are equal as entities. Two, yeah. And so therefore, Montana is way overrepresented. What other body? By per voter, yeah. But the Senate represents the entity of Montana. 
I'm sure California wouldn't see it that way. And what other body does that what other body does that directly mean that small states have a big advantage? Who who picks the president? Voters don't. The electoral college. No. Voters don't vote. I've never voted for the president, and I've, voted, I've been voting for president since 1778, which wasn't even an election year for president. Or 88. I can't remember which one, one of those two. But with that, nine votes are required to pass per law. That's to make sure that the central government cannot pass a law. Oh, did I say nine? What did I say? That means that it's almost impossible to pass a law. All it takes is five states to stop any law. So it's almost impossible to pass. This is what we call supermajority. Majority. I'll get to that when we get to the Senate, but the Senate has decided it requires a supermajority to pass anything in the Senate. It's called a filibuster. I'll tell you more about that a little bit later on. And 13 to amend it. Amend is change. And it's almost impossible to change this. It's almost impossible. Anything controversial to change the article cannot happen. And therefore, Smaller states will be desperate to keep this. And larger states are going to be desperate to change this. Absolutely desperate. This is going to have serious repercussions down the road as the earthquake hits above. And what kind of laws are passed? What is passed in this kind of thing? Nothing controversial. Nothing controversial will ever be passed. Of course, we have a system that requires a supermajority now, and nothing is passed. I mean, literally. I can't. The last major law to be passed that was even remotely controversial was in 2017, a big tax cuts for corporations. That's it. I mean, that's it. Then nothing is passed now. We are in a, it's kind of, it, it's, it's a similar crisis to then. And there's no executive. The executive is the body, this is a body in government that carry out, carries out the laws. It not only carries them out, it decides what the law says and then carries them out. They enforce it. Who is the executive? There's no executive in this government. Who is the executive of the United States today? Yeah, he's in a hospital right now. Anyone know that? It's President Trump. President Trump is the executive. Who's the executive in, in uh, Montana? Who? The governor. Who's the governor? Governor Bullock. Even though Montana has term limits, so when was that passed? Over, a little over 30 years ago, Montana had term limits, and now there's only two terms. There's nobody to carry out the laws. Nobody. Even if they pass a law, there's no entity that says, this is how the law will be enforced. In fact, the idea was the states would execute the laws. I should add, the, the Constitution kind of had this too for a lot of years, and this didn't work. Because what's going to make the states do it? There's no reason the states have to enforce a law they didn't like. And this is going to lead to a catastrophe, as they will see in 1787. If there's no power to carry out laws, there's no power to tax. They could not tax. They expected the states to give the Articles of Confederation government money. 
Anybody want to guess how many times the states gave them money? Yeah, no, they're not going to give them money. A couple states did when they realized nobody was doing it. They didn't do it. And therefore, they can't borrow money. Governments can't borrow money unless they can tax. Governments cannot function unless they can borrow money. They cannot function. Not only that, they couldn't control money. They were given no real power to control the money. In fact, every state had currency, cities had currency. They were still using old currency. They were using Spanish currency. They were using British currency. It was a chaotic system. So therefore, with no currency, they could not control inflation or deflation. By the way, if you can't tax, you can't have currency. Because nobody would believe that money would be worth anything unless you can tax. The United States government can tax. Part of the reason why people believe the US, that little green piece of paper you have is worth something, US currency. We tax. And this is really important. Because when the bell rings, the test will be tomorrow. All right, so I know I moved on. Don't forget the test. Uh, any questions on it? If you have any questions, please text me. And Jake, when you mentioned the entities, that was kind of a thing that they did after the fact. You're talking about um, a little bit later on when they started trying to justify uh, the Civil War. Then they're like, <laughs> like we did the Senate, we just, we got to figure out a way to come up with a compromise. I had like it's not meant to, it's, it was meant to represent the people. And then why is it better based on California? Set up with specific designs. 